Great. Well, welcome to the webinar, Unpacking the Fragrance Industry, Policy Failures, the Trade Secret Myths, and Public Health, hosted by Women's Voices for the Earth. Women's Voices for the Earth has been a leader in fragrance ingredient research and safety since 2007. Our fragrance campaign works includes the report, Secret Sense and What's That Smell? This new investigative report on the fragrance industry is the continuation of Women's Voices' work towards complete ingredient transparency and chemical safety. In addition to reports, Women's Voices works on policies and corporate campaigns that will increase the disclosure and safety of fragrance ingredients. Our work has led to companies like SC Johnson, Clorox, and Reckett Bainkaiser to increase disclosure of ingredients and fragrance, as well as, as well as remove some harmful fragrance ingredients. This webinar is part of a series we are doing on fragrance. The next webinar will be scheduled for early next year and will be focused on advocacy efforts happening that are currently happening to increase fragrance disclosure and safety. On today's webinar, Alex Alexander Scranton, author of the report Unpacking the Fragrance Industry, will give us an in-depth summary of the report's findings and will answer any questions you have at the end of the presentation. Alex is the Director of Science and Research at Women's Voices for the Earth. This report is a result of over six years of research and persistent watchdogging of the fragrance and cosmetic industries. Alex also authors Weave's other, Women's Voices' other scientific reports, including Secret Sense and What's That Smell, and provides scientific review for the organization's programs. So here's Alex. All right, thanks so much, Amy. Um, and thanks everyone for uh, attending the webinar. We've got a good, a good bunch of people um, on today. So today I'm gonna be talking about our, our new report, um, Unpacking the uh, Fragrance Industry. And I really look forward to having uh, time for a sort of rich discussion and, and Q&A um, about the impacts of the fragrance industry on public health um, and chemical regulations. And we really hope that the information in this report will be useful to many of you in a variety of uh, campaigns um, where you're finding that's kind of the fragrance issue is something of a sticking point, and we, we hope this is, is going to help. Um, so first, I'm going to get to. Um, oh, am I getting to the next slide? Okay. okay. Um, we'll start with the, the basic problem of fragrance safety, which will be very um, uh, common to, to many of you. Um, currently, the safety of fragrance chemicals is not determined by any governmental agency globally in any comprehensive fashion, right? Instead, the fragrance industry has been trusted to self-regulate um, and to establish its own uh, safety guidelines for the use of fragrance chemicals. And this is a familiar problem with chemicals and products of all kinds, um, where there's a lack of oversight and regulation as to how chemicals get used, um, and many factors and with a vested interest end up responsible for substantiating uh, their own safety. Um, but with fragrance, there's this added layer of complexity due to the historic lack of transparency in the industry. Fragrance, um, individual fragrance ingredients um, are not disclosed, um, which is unique in a lot of ways, uh, particularly in the realm of uh, household product chemicals. Next slide. Um, so when you, when you think um, of fragrance, and many people will often uh, connect that word um, with fine fragrances, perfumes, colognes, that kind of thing, but really fragrance is in, in a lot more than that. Um, you certainly find fragrance in numerous cosmetic and personal care products. Um, about 96% of shampoos sold in the U.S., for example, uh, contain fragrance, whether or not they're, they're marketed as scented. Um, fragrance is found in salon products. It's very prominently found in cleaning products, uh, uh, very heavily um, scented laundry products. Um, and then there's all the randomly scented products out there, like scented toilet paper and magic markers and, and paint and things like that. Um, fragrance is really ubiquitous, um, and we're all exposed in multiple ways throughout our day. Um, but what does that word um, fragrance actually mean? Um, there's no single chemical description for the word fragrance. Uh, the word actually represents thousands upon thousands of totally different and unique chemical mixtures, um, some of which have nothing uh, in common with the others. Um, but they're all officially called by that same single name and treated um, the same way. And as I said before, fragrance, uh, keep that on the slide, um, fragrance ingredients are not required to be disclosed. And this lack of uh, disclosure is actually codified by law around the world, um, particularly where you see ingredients of cosmetics being required to be disclosed on a label. You will always find this language which says, you know, something like, except that fragrance may be listed as fragrance, um, or perfume, aroma, there are a number of terms around the world. This is 
from the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act here in the U.S. from 1938. You find it in the EU Cosmetic Directive. Um, it's in Canadian cosmetic regulations, the New Zealand cosmetic standard. It's really worldwide, this exception from ingredient disclosure for fragrance um, is codified into law. And this lack of transparency, it adds this extra layer of protection kind of from inquiry, from investigation, from regulation. Um, this has resulted in an international state of ignorance on um, the chemicals present, uh, present in fragrance. fragrance. Um, there's ignorance on the part of regulators, um, scientists, health professionals, and consumers. Um, it's really hard to figure out what the implications of fragrance exposure are on public health when you don't actually know what anyone's specifically being exposed to. Um, for example, being told you're allergic to fragrance is a little like being told you're allergic to food. Right? The reality is that your body is reacting to certain specific fragrance ingredients. You just likely don't know which ones they are. Um, and if you did know, it wouldn't help much because the lack of disclosure clearly makes individual fragrance chemicals impossible to avoid. Um, and this is also, of course, problematic if there are other toxic chemicals in fragrance that you would like to avoid, like carcinogens or reproductive toxins. Um, and uh, I'll get to what we know about those um, a little later. Um, but we really believe a simple list of fragrance ingredients um, uh, present in a fragrance would actually provide enormous um, public health benefits to folks who want to know, really want to know what they're being exposed to. Okay, so the next slide. Um, a little uh, history on how and why this lack of transparency kind of situation came about for fragrance. Um, the fragrance industry is centuries old, right? And for most of its history, it's been a really refined art. Very specialized experts in fragrance, they call them the noses. Um, they would be creating these fragrances by hand. Um, and they would safeguard the formulas they developed literally with lock and key. Because without the formula, it was extremely difficult to replicate a fragrance. Um, even someone with a really good nose would have trouble you know, figuring it out without the formula. So naturally, the fragrance manufacturers wanted to protect the investments that they made in the development of their fragrances. And so it was kind of seen at the time as a reasonable concession to allow fragrance to be simply listed as fragrance so as not to give away these business secrets. Now, we fast forward to the 1970s and the innovation of gas chromatography, right? This new technology pretty much rocks the world of fragrance. Um, and um, uh, so now there are these GCMS machines, and they can independently identify and quantify the components in a fragrance. Um, suddenly, reverse engineering in the industry is possible. And it really creates all kinds of havoc. Um, counterfeiting in fragrance, particularly with fine fragrances, is kind of rampant. Um, it's no doubt very expensive for the industry. And of course, over the years, this technology keeps getting more and more sophisticated. And it's certainly commonplace now in any, in any fragrance house. Um, and we discussed the, the reverse engineering capabilities of some of the major fragrance houses um, in Appendix A of the report. So you can take, take a look um, at that. Um, but despite the advances in technology, um, this ingrained culture of secrecy in the fragrance industry remains. Um, you know, but the reality is there are no more ingredient secrets in fragrance, um, certainly not from competitors anyway who have the technology uh, to take each other's products apart. Um, the secrets that at this point are being kept from regulators and they're being kept from consumers. Yet amazingly, um, the industry will still claim make the claim that requiring ingredient disclosure will be seriously detrimental to their kind of financial picture. And it, it's something that's really hard um, to justify why they still sort of cling to this antiquated tradition of ingredient secrecy. Um, but it, you know, it, it's fairly understandable. It's a lot easier and less expensive for an industry to operate without a lot of external interference like government regulation. Um, and in lieu of, of government regulation, the industry has chose to self-regulate. It kind of keep everything in house and in order to maintain that sort of privilege of being able to self-regulate, um, they make great efforts and they certainly spend a lot of money convincing regulators that they are up to the job of keeping consumers from harm from using fragrance. And this is really why Women's Voices for the Earth um, chose to write this report, because we don't believe the industry is effectively regulating itself. Um, in fact, we believe there are many people out there, disproportionately women, um, who, whose health is currently harmed by fragrance and fragrance products. Um, certainly, the best data available comes from the dermatology literature. It's well documented that there are tens of millions of people across the world with skin allergies to fragrance. Um, if you want to know more about this, I encourage you to read our report, Secret Sense, which goes in, into greater detail. Um, but it's not just allergies. There's also uh, a smaller number of people 
um, of chemically sensitive folks um, who have very severe health reactions to fragrance, uh, which are not very well understood. And that's largely, again, because of the state of ignorance um, driven by the lack of ingredient disclosure. And then there are the untold numbers of others who health, whose health may also be affected by the carcinogens, reproductive uh, toxins, and endocrine disruptors that can be present in fragrance that they don't even know that they're being exposed to. Um, so we really believe there's a lot of potential harm from fragrance that's going undocumented and unacknowledged. Um, but if you listen to the industry's um, communications about their safety program, they'll tell you that they're ensuring the safety of fragrance and that almost no one's health is being adversely affected. Um, so we really we wrote this report to take a critical look at the fragrance industry's safety program to kind of spell out the loopholes and flaws that are allowing harm from fragrance to happen. Um, and we also felt the need to write this report because, frankly, the fragrance industry is pretty slick. I mean, they're really good marketers. They know how to do this. And when, when they talk about their safety program, it can sound really good. It's got a lot of buzzwords. It's been pretty convincing to regulators um, over the years. But the reality shows that it is truly lacking. So in the next few slides, I'm going to sort of attempt to take apart um, each piece of the safety uh, program and kind of show the reality um, of the situation. All right, so our next slide. Um, these are kind of the four main uh, key features or pillars of the fragrance industry's safety program. The first is um, peer-reviewed science put together by the Research Institute for Fragrance Materials, or RIFM. Um, the second is validation and review of the peer-reviewed science by an independent expert panel. The third is a comprehensive database of toxicological um, data and, and physical chemical properties associated with fragrance materials. And the fourth is um, the IFRA standards which are kind of the rules determining allowable levels of fragrance chemicals to be used in products. Now, on the face of it, this sounds pretty thorough, right? It, it, it really sounds pretty good. But OK, so here's the fun part. We'll kind of take these apart one by one. OK, so the first one um, is the uh, RIFM peer-reviewed science. OK, so what the industry says is says the, the Research Institute for Fragrance Materials um, is the international scientific authority for the safe use of fragrance materials. Um, the reality, when you actually look at the science, is that scientific studies on fragrance materials are generated by major fragrance manufacturers or Riffin's own laboratories. And largely, these studies have never been individually published or peer-reviewed. And what I might mean by this is when you look for the basic toxicology studies on individual fragrance ingredients, kind of the lab experiments on skin sensitization, the mutagenicity assays, the studies showing whether or not the chemical causes cancer in rats. Um, these kind of studies are almost never conducted by independent scientists, and they're almost never published in peer-reviewed journals. Um, now, they do have peer-reviewed science, which they do um, tout. Um, and what these uh, peer-reviewed articles are are the kind of summary safety assessments on individual fragrance chemicals. So they're, they're journal articles that do make claims of safety for fragrance ingredients, the problem being they base that those claims of safety on all the unpublished industry studies I was just talking about. So the groundwork science for all these claims are, are totally inaccessible uh, to the public. And we really have no idea of the quality of these studies conducted by industry, um, which are apparently determining the safety of these ingredients. Um, they're not publicly available, which is simply, it's simply not transparent or credible, or credible science. Um, and these published safety assessments are also only available for a limited number um, of fragrance materials, certainly not for all the fragrance ingredients out there. Okay. Um, the second piece of the, um, the uh, industry's safety program um, is the RIFM expert panel. Now, what um, they say about this is that all of RIFM's research is, inter uh, is reviewed by an independent expert panel an international group of dermatologists, pathologists, toxicologists, environmental, and respiratory scientists that have no commercial ties to the fragrance industry. Again, this sounds really good. It's kind of a don't trust us, trust this third party independent panel, which reviews everything that we do. Um, but here's how it really works. Um, there, there, you know, this panel does exist. You can find the, the names of these toxicologists um, online. Um, but the fragrance industry, particularly RIFM, they handpick and curate the science that the panel looks at in their reviews. So they actually create a research dossier on each of the chemicals, and you know, chances are the dossier is pretty flattering right, for, those, for those chemicals. Um, the second 
piece is that the expert panel has not actually reviewed all of RIFM's research. First of all, there's a lot of RIFM research that gets done. There's a lot of studies out there. Um, and the experts on this panel, I mean, apparently they're volunteers, have no commercial ties to the industry. Um, and they all have other jobs as toxicologists in, the, in their own right. I mean, there simply isn't the time for them to thoroughly review all the research that, that's being put out. Um, and there are also some very significant gaps. When I first heard about the expert panel, I was really interested to know what this independent panel has to say about some of the most controversial fragrance ingredients, chemicals like phthalates, for instance, um, or styrene, or musk. Um, what was the independent assessment of these chemicals in light of some other assessments out there of these chemicals that you know, certainly do not claim uh, their safety? Well, it turns out there are no assessments of these chemicals from the expert panel. They simply don't exist. Um, so either the expert panel has never been tasked with assessing the safety of these controversial chemicals, or if they have, they've never actually published their findings uh, one way or the other. So either way, it's really problematic. Um, it kind of raises doubt about the utility of the expert panel um, in ensuring fragrance safety. Um, OK, so the next piece um, is the comprehensive database on toxicological data. Um, what the industry says is they have this RIFM database um, through extensive research testing and constant monitoring of pertinent scientific literature. RIFM maintains this most comprehensive database of toxicological, ecotoxicological, and physical chemical properties associated with fragrance and flavor materials. OK, so the RIFM database does exist. Unfortunately, it's only accessible to those within the fragrance industry. You have to be an IFRA, that's the International Fragrance Association, um, an IFRA member to get access to the database. Um, there are non-member subscriptions available, but as I said, there's a, you know, a single non-member subscription is available for about $20,000 per year, and you can only get one if the request is authorized um, by a RIFM review committee. Um, and even those limited non-member subscriptions may not actually grant you a, uh, access to the industry-generated studies. So again, it sounds great that they manage this extensive database, but it's not transparent. I mean, it's simply not credible if no one outside the industry get to access it. Um, and it certainly shouldn't be sort of seen as a notch to their credit by regulators until this database is made public. Um, and people can look for themselves to assess the quality of the data that it actually contains. OK. So the last um, of the, the fourth piece of the safety program I wanted to discuss are the IFRA standards. Now, what the industry says is that the IFRA standards form the basis for the globally accepted and recognized risk management system for the safe use of fragrance ingredients. And the standards amount to 186 substances which have either been banned or restricted in their use in fragrance products. So to explain these standards, these are the, the rules that have been developed by IFRA, this is the International Fragrance Association, in consultation with their expert panel. And they either establish these kind of outright bans or restrictions on fragrance ingredients of how much you can put in a product. And this is kind of their self-policing effort in lieu of um, regulations that might otherwise force them to limit certain chemicals. You know, some of these standards, particularly some of the bans, are a good idea. We're not, you know, opposed to those. Um, but once again, we're not seeing any IFRA standards for many of the controversial fragrance ingredients that are out there. Um, phthalates, and, you know, going back to phthalates, there's no limit on any phthalate established in the, in the IFRA standards. Um, styrene, which is a, um, a known carcinogen, there's no limit on, on styrene. Benzophenones and other chemicals concerned can be used without restriction in fragrance. So there's really a huge question as to whether the standards that are being issued are actually the priority chemicals that should be restricted in fragrance. Now secondly, these standards are largely based on skin sensitization data. Um, and this, this sort of came about because the fragrance industry, you know, they don't want people getting rashes to fragrance because they know it doesn't sell you know, more products. right? And the, their goal has really been to reduce or eliminate skin reactions to fragrance by managing these levels of sensitizers. Um, that can be used. And they've been working on this for decades. Um, the result, however, is that they have largely failed. Um, the dermatology data is out there, and it indicates no decrease in fragrance allergy or sensitization in the last few decades. Right? In the US, in adults, the frequency of sensitization to fragrance um, in dermatology patients, it's actually increased significantly in the last decade. So, so while they have these standards that are supposed to be protecting us from allergy, there's no mechanism in the safety um, system that compares the standards 
to the reality on the ground of what's actually happening to people. So these standards have actually, you know, largely been in ineffective with regards to skin reactions. And then lastly, these standards are voluntary, and maybe this is why um, they've been ineffective. Um, they are required as a condition of membership to the International Fragrance Association, but there's little to no compliance verification. Um, so, you know, we all know how well voluntary rules can work in industry, and it's really anyone's guess as to how often they're actually um, adhered to. Okay. So one of the, one of the um, take homes here is that while the fragrance industry has really set up their own safety program and made their own rules, there are significant questions about the credibility and validity of the safety program to actually protect health. Um, there's a big question about the lack of transparency. Um, there's kind of, you know, begs the question of what they're hiding um, with that transparent, uh, lack of transparency. And then one of the, the other big questions in all of their science is whether or not they're prioritizing correctly. Um, they're publishing safety assessments um, and which largely conclude that fragrance chemicals are safe. And no doubt there are plenty of fragrance chemicals that are safe to use. Um, but it doesn't appear that they're actively asking the hard questions or investigating the toxic chemicals present in fragrance that the rest of the world appears to be concerned about. Um, so for part three of the report, um, we discuss the chemicals that are found on the IFRA list. And the IFRA list is a, a published list of over 3,000 chemicals currently used in fragrance based on an industry uh, survey that they've conducted over the years. Um, we cross-reference this industry list of chemicals with a number of lists of chemicals of concern that have been developed around the world. And we found a lot of fragrance chemicals on these lists, most of which don't have IFRA standards developed for them, and most of which don't have published safety assessments uh, published by the industry either. Um, as far as we know, they haven't been reviewed by the expert panel. Okay, next slide. Um, so for instance, kind of the, the big picture of the kind of inherent hazard in fragrance, we looked at um, UN GHS classifications. The GHS, this is the Globally Harmonized System of Classification and Labeling of Chemicals. It's an internationally agreed upon system that's been developed over the last several years. And what it does is it clarifies the hazard classification for chemicals and it recommends labeling for safety data sheets. So it's kind of this agreed upon consensus of how hazardous various chemicals are. Um, so what we found is that there are 190 uh, fragrance chemicals that have been assigned the word danger, which is the sort of highest level of, uh, of uh, you know, signal word for safety data sheets. Um, there are uh, over 1,000 fragrance chemicals that have been assigned the signal word warning, which is kind of one step down from danger. You put these together and it's over a third of fragrance chemicals in use have been assigned either danger or warning, which gives a, sort of a picture of the inherent hazard of the chemicals. Um, there are 44 fragrance chemicals that specifically require the pictogram of a skull and crossbones on their safety data sheets to indicate acute toxicity. And then there are 97 fragrance chemicals that have a pictogram indicating the chemical as a hazard to human health. Um, so these are, um, you know, indications of, of hazards and these are not, again, these chemicals are not ones that we're finding um, if for standards for or um, if for safety assessments. Okay. So we also looked at a number of other um, lists of chemicals of concern. So go to the next slide. Um, this, for example, is a list of the 11 fragrance chemicals we found that are currently on the California Proposition 65 list um, of carcinogens and reproductive. These are mostly carcinogens. There's a few reproductive um, toxicants on the list. Um, we also looked at go to the next slide. Um, the Washington State list of chemicals of high concern to children. Um, we found 15 fragrance chemicals on this list. Um, and this is interesting as there's been relatively little in the way of reporting of chemicals from fragrance products in Washington State so far, which is what this, this Washington State program does. Um, and there's a real question as to whether there's under-reporting happening due to this lack of uh, fragrance disclosure. Um, the last list I wanted to show you, next slide. Um, this is the list of fragrance chemicals that we found that are on um, Annex 2 of the Cosmetic Directive in the European Union. These are chemicals that are prohibited from use um, from cosmetics in the EU. Um, and here, again, interesting, it's really unclear who is checking to see whether any of these chemicals, which are prohibited, prohibited from cosmetics, may be showing up in the fragrances in cosmetics. Again, there's no um, disclosure of, the, of these chemicals, and it's really hard to figure out how that compliance um, is being enforced. Um, on our website, you can find these lists. We've got them all um, 
uh, detailed on, on our website associated with the report. Um, and we've, we've got several other lists that we also cross-reference. I didn't develop slides for them, but it's the Canadian Cosmetic Ingredient Hot List, um, the EU Endocrine Disruptors List, the Chemsec uh, Sin List, the California DTSC Candidate Chemical List, um, the IARC and NTP Carcinogens List. All of these lists contain chemicals found on the IFRA fragrance chemicals list um, that, due to lack of disclosure, are currently hidden both from consumers and regulators. And with, with just a very few exceptions, there's like one or two that, that I've, I've noticed, um, the fragrance industry safety program has not issued standards or published recent safety assessments for these internationally recognized chemicals of concern. Um, instead, they seem to be ignored altogether. Um, and these are pretty significant omissions and represent kind of a failure in the system. I mean, in my mind, it really further demonstrates that the fragrance industry is not living up to its claims it's making about the safety of their products, and they really shouldn't be trusted by regulators to ensure the fragrance of safety either. Okay, so my last um, slide is looking at some general recommendations that we have developed that we see really as crucial to improving the safety of fragrance products. Um, the first is really the disclosure piece. We need federal and or state legislation uh, that requires product-specific disclosure of fragrance on a you know, basic right-to-know level. People deserve to know what they're being um, exposed to in fragrance products. Um, secondly, we need federal and state legislation that requires fragrance to meet an unbiased standard of safety. Um, most recently, there's the Personal Care Product Safety Act by Feinstein and Collins, which seeks to more stringently regulate ingredients in cosmetics. Unfortunately, this bill really does give a pass to fragrance. It continues the, the exemption of um, disclosure of fragrance ingredients and therefore kind of you know, excludes them from, from meeting a, a bar of safety. Um, lastly, we believe that, that right away, sort of in the immediate term, manufacturers need to be taking responsibility um, for their fragrance products. Um, they can and should be voluntarily disclosing uh, fragrance ingredients to their, um, to their customers on a product-specific basis. Um, some manufacturers, like SC Johnson & Son, they're makers of, of Windex and, and other products, um, they're starting to disclose a lot more fragrance ingredients in their products, and then uh, RB and Clorox are as well looking particularly at fragrance allergens. Um, and then lastly, we want manufacturers to be developing and disclosing um, comprehensive chemical screening processes, which detail how they ensure the safety of their products, including their fragrance products. They need to be taking um, responsibility for the safety of their fragrance products and not just taking you know, the word of the fragrance industry that the fragrances that they're buying are, are safe for their products. So that is the end of my presentation. I think we can go to questions and I will hand it back to Jamie. Great. Thanks so much, Alex. Um, I'm, if you have a question, you can type it into the chat box on the left-hand side of your screen. I'm also, um, I will also unmute everyone. And if you are not speaking, if you could place your own phone on mute to cut down on background noise, we'd really appreciate that. So let's just, I'm going to take a moment to unmute everybody. There's going to be a quick pause. The conference has been unmuted. We do have a couple questions in the chat box that we can start with. Um, one question is where, how have you been able to review RIFM safety studies on fragrance chemicals if they are not publicly available? Oh, okay. So that's a good question. So what, what is publicly available are these summary safety assessments. Um, and so that's what we've been able uh, to review. And in those, when you look at the citations, you, you know, you will see a, a particular chemical and they'll say, you know, this is not mutagenic and we've determined that it's not carcinogenic. And they'll have citations for those. So you look in the, the list of references and it'll say, you know, X fragrance house, unpublished data. You know, this study was done, you know, a carcinogenic study was done by this fragrance house, unpublished data from 1975 or whatever. So that's how we've been assessing um, these studies. We've never been able to see that unpublished data, um, so that can't be, um, can't be uh, reviewed. But the summary, um, uh, the, the summary safety assessments have been published in, um, in two particular journals uh, that seem to be sort of friendly to, to the industry. And then there's, uh, I'm just going to get to some of these questions in the chat box. Um, we will be making these slides available. I'll send a link out uh, to the presentation um, after, after we've concluded. Um, and then there's also a question, what would state legislation look like? I mean, we do have one example of that, and I think there are some folks on the phone who are also working on it. But in California, there's 
AB 708, which would require um, disclosure of ingredients in cleaning products, including fragrance. Um, so that's an example of state uh, legislation, and you can, you know, find find the text online. And I'd also tomorrow be happy to talk to you about that more afterwards as well. But that's one example of a disclosure mm -hmm. bill um, that's happening on the state level. And it would be great to see more st states introduce similar legislation because it really puts pressure. I mean, not only on the cleaning product industry, but it really pressures the fragrance industry, um, you know, to be to, to disclose more. And that crosses, obviously, more products than just cleaning products. Mm -hmm. And then we have an, uh, another question here. Um, regarding a manufacturer's toxic chemical screening process, are there any best practices to point to that are publicly available? Mm -hmm. Are there any brand coalitions working towards developing or implementing such a screening process? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, yes, there are. I mean, there, there are a number of um, organizations that are working on kind of developing these tools for, for manufacturers on how to develop these um, chemical screening processes. Um, so I don't know if you... Um, There's like business yeah. NGO yeah, right. has a great yeah. um, guide that companies can use right. to, um, you know, to, to create a safer screening process. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are also... Um, we have examples like eco labels, for example, Safer Choices, formerly design, EPA's Design for the Environment. They have um, certain criteria that they use um, for for the Safer Choice label, um, and that's that's an one example of kind of the the safety criteria that um, manufacturers can use. Um, we also list more examples. We were we released a report called Deep Clean, and that is really um, a campaign to get the cleaning industry to develop exactly this, to develop a toxic chemical screening process. Um, and so that's a great report to, to check out too, and you can find that um, on our website. And, I'm, and you know, if other folks want to, I know that there are more, yeah, so if other folks exactly. want to chime in, yeah. um, feel free. Um, let's see. Oh, hi, this is Amy Ziff with Non-Toxic Certified, and I just want to say that we would, um, if a brand worked with us, we could catch a lot of these things um, uh, in our process because we don't allow, for example, any phthalates, and we have a lot of those lists in our massive, um, you know, overall toxin screening list, so um, anything that was also uh, on Prop 65, for example, would, or the Chem Secretariat SIN list and numerous others would um, also be screened out. And they, the companies participating with us have to um, fully disclose fragrance to us. So, um, so there's that. And ultimately, when we lab test, we can see if something's popping that you know, shouldn't be there, that maybe slipped through unbeknownst to a, you know, supplier trying to do the right thing or manufacturer trying to write, do the right thing, but where, you know, a dirty supply chain um, could, could taint something, fragrance or not. Okay, thanks, Amy. Um, and then we have another question. Um, what, uh, what product categories does GHS um, apply to besides cleaning products? Uh, does it also include cosmetic products? Are the same chemicals pretty much used in cosmetics? and cleaning products for, yeah, like, fragrance chemicals. Sure. And the, the way that the GS is came, came uh, it, it's not specifically for um, one industry over the other. It's really for the chemicals that are used in industry. So, and it is geared to providing, you know, consistent information on safety data sheets. So any product for which you have to develop a safety data sheet, the, the chemicals used in those products um, will have GHS classifications. So there aren't as many cosmetic products. I guess there, you know, there are some as far as salon products, but not a lot of cosmetic products have um, SDS uh, sheets. So there, there could be some, some chemicals missing from, from GHS. But overall, it's, it's meant to classify uh, chemicals that, that are being used um, you know, in, in a workplace. So I have a question. If they're classified like that, does that mean that they're required to be listed, disclosed, on an, an SDS sheet and the product label? Um, no, it, you know, the, the GHS is a, it's a globally harmonized system that's been, you know, as I said, internationally agreed upon, but then every country has taken that system and applied it the way they, you know, to, to their laws as, as, as it's applied. So, 
Um, and then there's a lot of um, manufacturer um, discretion as to how they use the information from the GHS. Um, so it's not just because the you know, GHS says you know it absolutely has to have you know a skull and crossbones doesn't necessarily translate that you're going to see that on an SDS because that's up to the manufacturer to decide whether or not to do it. Um, but if we thought it was demonstrative that you know these chemicals kind of agreed upon internationally as being hazardous. Um, but that's kind of how, how that how that works. So we had another question here. Um, Regarding recommendations, I think I can respond to this. Are you recommending both that they voluntarily d disclose fragrance ingredients and that there be legislation to mandate disclosure? Um, if so, this could be sending a mixed message. Oh, so okay. the end goal is mandatory, um, a mandatory requirement to disclose ingredient, fragrance ingredients. That's the end goal because that creates kind of this u uniformity of of labeling practices, which we don't have right now, um, even with the voluntary disclosure that we have with companies like SC Johnson and Clorox. Um, in the meantime, you know, it, it's our by pushing the industry, these companies like SCJ and Clorox to disclose before we have legislation passed. I think that it helps um, also push the fragrance industry to um, just I don't know be more open to that. I don't know mm -hmm. if that's right, but it puts pressure on them to know that fragrance disclosure, kind of the writing's on the wall for them. So I think it doesn't have to be an either or. Mm -hmm. I think the two really complement um, each other, both the market campaigns and then the policy piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the, the voluntary disclosure that we're, we're recommending is kind of more of an immediate term, recognizing that mandating ingredient disclosure could, could take a little longer. Right, especially yeah. on the federal sure, level. Sure, exactly. Um, then we have another question. Can you speak? Oh wait, uh, let me go back to this one. Um, given that GCMS allows companies to identify fragrance ingredients, why are they so resistant to disclosure? Because of the toxic. Oh, is uh, it because of the toxics they use? Yeah, I, you know, it's it's a really good question. I haven't had too many opportunities to talk with. Um, uh, fragrance houses specifically about this question because I don't understand it either. Um, it's very clear that the technology can, you know, fairly easily, you know, reverse engineer a fragrance. Um, yet they will, you know, absolutely stand by, or a lot of companies will stand by saying that, that they can't disclose because it's, you know, it's going to be detrimental to, the, to their fin finances. Um, I, it, it, it is a long, ingrained kind of historical culture within the fragrance industry to have a lot of secrecy. And they have secrecy about a lot of other things as well, like client lists and things like that. It's very hard to figure out who is using what fragrance house because they don't like to disclose that information either. So I think there's a real cultural shift that has to happen in the fragrance industry. Um, we're seeing it happen slowly, um, and we think that, that you know, as, as Jamie was saying, that the, the writing's on the wall. But it, there's really no scientific justification uh, for it because it, it's clear that they can take each other, you know, take apart each other's products to, to, to a great extent, and that they do on a regular basis. So. And then we had another question here. Can you speak more to international regulation and or disclosure of fragrance chemicals? Are fragrance chemicals required to be disclosed anywhere in the world? Anywhere in the world, how does the EU manage the European Union manage the safety of fragrance chemicals through through their cosmetics directive or reach or or do they? Um, yeah, really, really good question. Um, there, I, I haven't found any examples uh, where disclosure of fragrance chemicals is, um, of, you know, full disclosure of fragrance chemicals is is mandated uh, by law anywhere in the world. I, yeah, everywhere I've I've looked, I see the exception uh, for fragrance being just disclosed as fragrance. Um, in the European Union, um, there is um, the list of 26 fragrance allergens. So these are particular um, fragrance ingredients where if there's a certain threshold met in a product, those for, for both cosmetics and cleaning products, those have to be disclosed on the label uh, to help people with allergies. And they're you know, currently working on that. Um, they may be expanding that list of 26 to up to 82. Um, up to 82 allergens. So there's that. That's a one specific example of, of greater um, uh, fragrance disclosure that we've been able to get more companies to do voluntarily, um, at least with the allergen part. Um, as far as how the, the EU manages the safety of fragrance chemicals, I you know I don't know as much about that. They do have a list of chemicals they don't allow um, in in fragrance, but as I said, you know we found this list of chemicals that are you know according to the fragrance industry present in fragrance. Yet, which are um, 
that are they're you know banned from from use in cosmetics in the EU, and I don't know how that's being being handled or or whether or not it's in fact being handled, um, or whether it's kind of un, you know under under the wire uh, due to the lack of disclosure. Do they have to present a certificate of safety in the EU? Um, I'm not sure. That, okay. I'm not sure. Yeah. Folks have other questions? You can type them into the chat box or um, speak up. And just as a, uh, as a reminder, the full report is on our, our website um, that's listed on this last, si last slide. Uh, we also have a two-page fact sheet um, that's really handy that includes the recommendations um, that, that, that you saw here. And then also online we have Appendix B, which lists all um, the fragrance chemicals on authoritative lists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can we speak up from the phone? Yeah. Yes. Please go ahead. Hi, it's Bill, Bill Alia with Environmental Working Group in Sacramento. I'm working on the uh, ingredient disclosure bill on cleaning products. Uh, in uh, reference to this question about, so why are they so against disclosure? We've been going around on this over and over again. They argue they're lobbyists in the capital. It's like the end of capitalism if they have to reveal these things. Fragrance houses will collapse, and industry will be hurt. Procter & Gamble, Unilever, it's just horrible. In the end, I kind of think it may be because it would allow consumers to hold a product in each hand and go, oh, look, they're essentially the same, all a cheaper one. Because they spend a ton on marketing to say it's the fresh scent or whatever. So they, I think it just threatens their, their profit that people will make other choices. Yeah. My guess. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> Thanks for that, Bill. Good that's insight. Exactly. That's helpful. Um, we had another question. Um, are Feinstein and Collins open to including fragrance in their bill? So. Yeah. Fragrance is in the bill. It's just you know there's this issue of where there's um, this loophole where uh, fragrance does not have to be disclosed publicly, and um, fragrance doesn't really have to meet any safety standard. Basically, what fragrance houses or manufacturers fragrance houses just present this cert you know sort of certificate of safety, but it's not clear like what standard of safety um, you know they're meeting. So that's a real problem, and, and, and when I send out um, the link to this webinar, I'll also send out the link to a blog that I that's just kind of a more in-depth analysis of um, Senator Feinstein and Collins' um, bill. But I hope right now there is, um, we are trying to put pressure on her office, um, their offices, to uh, maybe amend it to include uh, more uh, stringent um, regulations over fragrance. So we really were hopeful that that could be a vehicle to move more fragrance disclosure and fragrance safety, but what's going to need to happen is we're really going to need to lobby her office essentially to make sure that that happens. Um, and then we had another question here. Jen, I hope that answered your question. Um, we had another, another question here. Can you speak to specific state and federal laws that exist that protect fragrance chemicals as CBI and or trade secrets. Okay, sure. And uh, th there are probably more out there than I'm aware of, and it would be great to, to, to pull together a bigger list. I mean, the, the biggest one is really the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, you know, originally from, from 1938, which has that language saying, except that fragrance may be listed as fragrance. That's the, you know, the main uh, law that requires disclosure of chemicals. Uh, in uh, cosmetic products on the label, except the fragrance uh, gets this exemption. Um, there are some other ones. There, there's um, the, let's see, the California um, Safe Cosmetics Bill, which is much more of a reporting law. They can also exempt uh, uh, specific fragrance ingredients from being disclosed. Um, I'm trying to think of other, I've, I've seen some other ones as well. There are certain sort of VSC laws and stuff. Um, but those are the two that, that I can think of specifically. But I don't know if anyone else on, on the call has, has other examples where they've seen um, exemptions of fragrance. It would be great to pull a, a list like that together. Mm -hmm. That would be helpful. Yeah, because it seems to be fairly, fairly rampant that that, that, gets, that that gets an exemption. Other questions? Just type them into the chat box, or you can um, just speak up. Everyone's uh, um, unmuted. Else? 
Well, I will, um, as I said, I will be sending around a link to um, the recording of the webinar, which will allow you to hear the audio but also um, see the slides. Uh, again, I'll also send a link to our report um, and the fact sheet and the uh, Appendix B. Um, and I, I will also include a link to um, the blog analyzing um, Senator Feinstein and Collins' bill uh, that kind of goes into a little more detail on the fragrance issue. So if there are no more burning questions, um, I'm going to go ahead and end the webinar. Mm -hmm. And if you do have questions that you think of after the fact, uh, feel free to email Alex at e -L -O -A -L -E -X -S at womensvoices.org. You can also find her um, email on the website. Yep. So thank you, everybody, for coming. And um, we'll talk soon. All right. Thanks very much.